Okay, fifth time is the charm, hopefully. Um, let's uh, make sure that's all still going. And okay, cool. Yeah, we got all that. Um, all right, sweet. What's up, everyone? Um, I go by Saw Good. Uh, this is video seven of my uh, Ableton Starter series. Um, this is going to be the third one in a little mini uh, sound design um, series to kind of get you up to speed with some core uh, concepts in, in some more complex sound design processes. Um, so this video is going to be all about uh, racks, instrument racks, and audio effects racks. Um, pretty much everything that I do in Ableton is, is in a rack uh, at some point. I mean, not like literally everything, but uh, most of my more advanced sound design stuff and uh, just a lot of more creative processing in general um, comes down to racks. So Let's start off with what is a rack. Uh, let me pull an operator in here. I have some stuff, like I said, I've, I've, I've uh, recorded this video like four other times and had different audio issues and um, other things of that nature. So I think I finally got it all figured out. Let me just uh, check all this and make sure we're still getting. Yep, all right, cool. Um, Sweet. So yeah, rather than do the entire thing um, from scratch, I just saved this project and figured I would kind of emulate what I already did. Um, so I have an operator patch. Uh, let's say I want to start layering um, stuff in an instrument rack. Well, first, the way that instrument racks work is if you hit Command G on any instrument, any MIDI device, um, it can be a third party VST or a native Ableton thing, uh, it'll group it. You can also always right click and hit group. Once you have this, you'll notice that there are uh, these new controls on the side here. This is going to show you your chains. This is going to show you the devices on each chain. This is going to open up your macro controls. Um, this opens up macro presets, uh, which we're not really going to get into. This is something new in 11. Um, and honestly, I'm not the expert in it yet. So uh, I'm going to hide the macros, hide all that for now. So the way instrument racks work, and audio effect racks too, but I'll get to that to kind of go over it again. Um, you have multiple chains. Each chain is essentially identical to uh, the processing that would just be on a regular um, channel. Like for instance, if I um, open up an operator and I have this operator, this EQ8, and this utility. Well, I can group all three of those. And now that same processing chain right there is on one chain in an instrument rack. And if I wanted to, uh, let's say, duplicate it and do something different, to this guy and do something different to this and add an overdrive or something in there and throw that on here. The signal is going to come through this chain all the way through, this chain all the way through, and sum together right here at the, uh, the end of the uh, instrument rack. And then move on to whatever other processing you have. So let's say I want to, uh, I'm just going to start layering stuff. Um, I like to draw on a couple little harmonics for a nice little beefy sub. All right, ooh, let's go back to this one. All right, cool. Um, let's uh, create a new chain. So you can always right click right here and hit create chain. Um, you can also, if I like, um, find an operator and just drag it in here. If you don't drag it into the chain and just drag it into this section, it'll just open up a new chain as well with your default um, device that you're dropping in there. So either way works. Um, all right, on this operator, I will make like, let's see, what did I do in this guy? I uh, just did like a saw wave with a little uh, envelope thing going on. All right, so I'm gonna turn this to a saw wave. Um, put a little filter envelope on this guy, maybe something like this, let's see. Um, and if you solo it, you can hear what's going on with just this one. And turn the envelope all the way up on this um, filter envelope here. And I'm going to turn the um, key, key tracking down. And turn that guy down. All right, so now I'm going to take uh, one of these EQ8s. And um, again, I'm holding uh, Option and dragging to duplicate drag. You can also just you know hit Copy, Paste. Um, Throw this in here, and I'm going to put a little high pass on it. So I'm cutting out all the lows to this saw wave. So now it sounds more like. And let me actually 
actually move this guy out a little bit more. That's cool. Um, and I'm actually going to put this, uh, let's see, one voice, but take off the glide. I think I have it off on here. And it sounded pretty cool because that way that envelope nope i actually do have it on there so that's cool i'll leave it on um okay let's do uh another one what did i have going on in here um just some random fm nonsense and a little lfo and, uh, and a filter so all right so grab this chain i will search for another operator drag it onto here and let's solo this guy so we can just hear what we're working with here all right pull that up and actually, I'm going to do the same thing with this EQ8. So the benefit of doing stuff this way is that, um, for instance, off the bat, I can high pass this or do whatever EQing I want onto here um, without affecting the other chains. So you'll also notice that on uh, this one, here I'll actually label these two, um, Command R, you can always right click, uh, Sub, and let's go um, Saw. This will be some FM nonsense. Uh, let's see. All right. This up a little bit. All right, let's put a little filter envelope in here. And same thing, pull the envelope up, pull the key tracking down. And probably same thing, I'll make this uh, come out a lot longer. Let's uh, pull this out. So. All right, so we got so far is. And I'm going to make this a little quieter and also bring this guy down. That's cool. Uh, maybe let's give it a little spread too. Cool. And let's do another one. Let's just grab another operator, toss it right in here. Um, let's make like a little like white noise thing. Let's call this one uh, white noise. That's that's cool, right? That's what the kids are doing these days. Um, for this guy, I am going to um, take a white noise oscillator and FM like a low. Uh, I mean, you can just do it that way too. It's a little aggressive. Uh, I'm going to take the transpose and draw this down. And put a little spread on this too. And maybe actually put a pitch envelope on here too. Let's just see what happens. to take an auto pan and just kind of like uh, give it some more movement and take another one of these guys drag duplicate again that's um, option hold option while you drag on a Mac uh, and on a PC uh, I honestly don't know maybe like control hold control or something like that um, whatever the equivalent of option is probably uh, let's see I'm going to that works and then let's maybe turn the phase down and let's uh, solo this real quick. That's kind of cool. Maybe. Ooh, it's kind of... It's 
kind of cool. Uh, I might drop that, drop that a little bit too. Cool. Just a nice little, nice little noise thing in the background. Um, let's see what else did I have going on in here? Right, I had a little sample. So here is the other cool thing. It doesn't all need to be operators. You can take a serum or a sampler, whatever you want, and throw that in here too. So um, I'll take a, a sampler and find like a foley thing. I think in the other one I used like. Um, like some like water from a stream that I sampled uh, or a lake or something to that effect. So yeah, yeah, kind of like that. All right, so I'm gonna throw that in here. I think this is actually the one that I used last time and take like a little patch where it's not too chaotic and let's see, ooh, let's pull this and maybe do a little crossfade action so we can get a little loop from this. And what if we bring this down even like... Oh, that can be cool, let's see. back over here or what if we actually just choose a whole different section see what's going on over here all right cool um sweet so like i was saying and let's actually uh, do the same thing um copy uh, duplicate drag one of these guys over here so we can kind of I might actually even just bring this up a little more. let's uh nah I liked whatever it was at cool yeah that's cool alright and I might turn this up just tiny a little bit uh okay Sweet. So, all right. So, all these are going to come together. This guy, this, this, that, and this, and sum together right here at the end of this rack, and then move throughout the rest of your processing into whatever you have. Um, so, it's a really easy way to just start like stacking, uh, layering stuff. Like, I use a lot of like organic instruments too via contact or um, just throwing like a guitar hit into an Ableton sampler or something like that. Um, you can get a lot of cool stuff really quickly and it gives you a ton of sort of creative control over stuff um, since you can process each chain so exactly and have it all summed together. Um, and that way too, by the way, like let's make sure this is on uh, 12. Everything kind of works together as well. Like if I like do like a pitch bend on here. Everything kind of works in harmony. So um, let's move into what are audio effects racks. And I'm gonna show you a couple of cool ways to use them. Um, the whole point of this video, I really just wanted to kind of give you guys some options, show you how uh, racks work and kind of start showing you some of the cool things you can do um, with racks. So um, I'm going to do a couple things with some audio effects racks. Um, just kind of give you some ideas for stuff. Uh, and then we'll I'll kind of show you um, what you can do with it really easily, uh, play through this little riff or make a new riff, um, and then I'll go back and do one more uh, specific kind of type of instrument rack that I use for a lot of bass uh, resampling, um, which we'll actually go into a lot in the next video as well, since that'll all be about resampling, but I'll kind of like um, at least tease it in this. So moving on to audio effects racks. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, first thing, um, this is something I did cover, I think in maybe the last one, but um, it's always worth covering again. I basically split all of my processing after the instrument itself into um, different bands for processing. I have like a three band splitter and a two band splitter. So I'll go through how to make one of those really quick. Um, first thing is take like an EQ8 and group it up. I'm going to open up my chains and duplicate this guy. So now I have two um, identical. And by the way, anytime you, you duplicate um, chains and they're identical, let me like turn this one off. This is the mixer um, button, by the way, if you want to turn it on or off. Um, you also have some basic you know, volume and pan 
uh, mixer on and off and solo. Um, if I turn that off really quick, this is our signal right now. If I have both of these chains that are identical playing, it's just essentially going to double the volume. Um, if I did a third, same thing. It would just, you know, add that much more volume into it. Um, so what we're going to do to make this, I'm going to uh, rename this and call it like two band splitter. Um, and I'm going to throw a high pass on here. And actually, I'm going to move this to the top. Uh, and on this one, I'm going to put a low pass on here and I'm going to right click the frequency map to macro one. doesn't really matter where they are for right now. Uh, and same thing with the, uh, high pass cutoff point, the one band in this case, right click the frequency map to the same macro that you did before. Um, so now we got this little knob here and as we move it around, you'll see that these are both in the exact same place as each other except one is a high pass and one is a low pass. Um, some things to note here is like, you know, these aren't like brick wall, um, high pass, low pass. So uh, there will be a little bit of overlap here. Like you can kind of imagine this curve kind of comes down. Um, this is a pretty good like resonance cue to leave it at like 0 0.71, 0 0.7, somewhere in the high 0.6s or something like that. Um, mostly just make sure that it is uh, the same. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's music production. You can kind of do whatever you want. But um, personally, I just kind of leave it at the default, which I think is this 0.71. Um, I'm going to rename this high and rename this low. And bam, now we got it. So what's happening here is, as I play out this whole instrument we just made, this top band is only letting through these frequencies. And the bottom one is only letting through these. And I can control where that cutoff point is with this knob. So if I wanted at say 180, and then I go back to this one, that's all that's coming through there. So um, things we can do with this, uh, for instance, anything with stereo uh, spread. Since you don't really want to stereo spread your your sub, um, you can leave that in mono and do all kinds of stereo effects like reverbs, delays, choruses, uh, whatever. So um, I think. Since this will actually be the first video that wasn't mistakenly recorded in mono, uh, I'm going to cover a really simple way to uh, use like a Haas effect, um, stereo effect. So let's take a delay and throw this onto here. And here's an important note about this um, like band splitter. Um, all the processing pretty much has to go before the, the EQ8. Uh, the reason being because if you put it on after and you put things like certain distortion or saturation, um, compression, etc., you can actually bring back up the lows um, to a point where there is some conflict going on after you um, do a bunch of stuff to it between uh, the signal coming out of the high band and the low. You really want it to be pretty split. So for that, you need the EQ8 at the end of the chain on both cases. Um, so with this delay, let's put the feedback at zero the dry wet to 100 I'm gonna turn the sync off and the link off turn the sync off on this one too. put this one at one millisecond um, and just to kind of show you what's going on here with with them with them linked any delay that I put here with a hundred percent wet and zero feedback is literally just gonna delay the signal like if I like you know put this at 400 milliseconds and I press a key on my keyboard <laughs> So you hear the sub come through first because right the lows don't have the processing section. Let me just turn that off. Okay, it happened 400 milliseconds after. Um, so let's put this back to one, unlink these, and put this somewhere pretty close to one, but not quite one. Um, usually I find anywhere between like four and ten works pretty well. So if we do this, you're going to hear something like this. Versus if I turn this off on so that is what's known as a Haas effect delay um, essentially what's happening there is um, you know if someone's talking to you from your right side the sound is going to hit your right ear a little bit quicker than it hits your left ear and it's going to be a little bit louder in your right ear than it is in your left now uh, if we hear a signal that is directly in front of us it's the same volume and it hits both of our ears at essentially uh, the same time so if we have a sound that is the same volume in both ears, but hits one ear just a tiny bit before the other, uh, our brain knows that it's not coming from right in front of us, but it also has a hard time processing where the sound is coming from. Um, so because they're the same volume, 
but it does know that there's a little bit of a delay, so it knows that it's uh, somewhere kind of around you, and it kind of sounds like it's on both sides of you, gives you a really nice big uh, stereo spread. Um, it's true that uh, it can lead to some phase issues, like if you ever sum this together, you'll get some phasing, because you're literally just putting the left and right um, signal out of phase with each other. Um, so there are some other things you can use, like um, wider, I think, is one from Infected Mushroom uh, via Polyverse. And personally, I use a Sound Toys plugin called MicroShift, which basically just does two things. It does the Haas effect delay. Um, let me turn this off. And it also uh, does a tiny bit of detuning. So that kind of helps offset the, the phasing issues that you would get. That's with that one and with the regular Haas effect Ableton delay. So, um, and that's just in this case, this sound has a lot of stuff going on. Like it has the white noise, it has the sample that's being a little warped, um, the FM stuff, saw. So uh, in this case, you know, both are gonna have just drastically different effects because, um, you know, you might get more or less phasing or different kinds of stuff going on. So anyway, moving on, um, let's start uh, just doing some other cool processing to this. Um, so here is something, I'm gonna pull in a reverb. Um, I'm gonna make a rack out of this as well and I'm gonna put it on the top band of the two band splitter rack that we just did. Um, with this, I'm going to uh, put my dry wet up to 100, put my decay up to 60. I'm gonna um, turn off the high cut here and uh, all this is just like kind of to taste. Also shout out Vector for showing me this uh, cool little hack because before that I never used uh, Ableton reverb, stock reverb. Uh, I always use like Valhalla Vintage Verb or Pro R, and I still do use those um, every now and again, but I also use the Ableton Stock Reverb a lot when used this way. So I'm gonna put a chain um, with that reverb just by grouping it into another audio effect rack. I'm gonna create a chain, right click, and hit Create Chain in the little this little area. Um, and I'm just gonna leave that completely empty. So that's a, a dry chain, there's nothing on it. The signal is gonna hit that chain and pass right through but the signal is also gonna hit this chain and pass through this reverb with 100% wet and 60 second decay time. So I'm gonna pull this all the way down to negative infinite, so it's essentially off, and I'm gonna right click that and map that to macro one. Um, so now we have this chain volume right here. Um, I'm also going to right click the decay time, the 60 second decay time on the reverb and map that to macro two. So now I can just kind of uh, click this and turn that off. Actually, I can just kind of keep that off too and just have this like that. Um, I called mine just like reverb with two Bs, just something that's like easy to search, maybe reverb with like two Rs in the front or something. Um, and basically with this, we have, uh, let's, I'll, I'll do this really quick. Just put a little, let's see, where's this coming from? Cool, so uh, if I play it as is, oh, and by the way, I am gonna throw this on the top band because we really don't need reverb on the low end. Um, there are rare occasions when I do that, but uh, for the most part, unless it's pretty intentional, like in an outro or a bridge where I want stuff to get really muddy and crazy, um, I'm not going to put any reverb on the low end. So with this, um, it's going to play the sound. Nothing happens, right? Because the wet chain is all the way down and the dry chain is just a dry chain. If I turn this knob up, anytime after, it's basically what's happening is this is going to play through and it's still going to pass through this um, this this chain. So it's going to pass through this reverb that's 100% wet with a 60 second decay time and for 60 seconds sort of um, decay. It's not really sending any signal from this to the mixer because I have the chain volume all the way down at negative infinite, but it's still triggered it and it's still technically happening. Um, so at any point, you know, within reason, within at least 60 seconds or at most 60 seconds, uh, which is, you know, half a song, I can turn this up and still get that reverb. So it's just a way to really get like a complete sort of control over your reverb. Um, you can also just use it as a regular reverb by having it up to taste and having the decay time down something like, you know, like this. So. So, um, yeah. That's a cool thing you can do with the uh, reverb on an audio effect rack. Um, I'm gonna leave that like that for now. And let's see, did I really do anything? Yeah, I probably like put some overdrive and stuff. Um, I'm gonna throw some overdrive on this, just kind of like, I don't know, throw some random stuff on here uh, just to, let's see, put this down. 
I'm going to throw an LFO. This is a Max for Live uh, device, but anyone with Sweet or Max for Live should have it. Map this to the frequency, pull the rate down, and pull the offset and the depth down. Um, I'm going to eventually do a whole series on like covering the controls of every single one of uh, Ableton's native devices. So at some point, I'll do a deep dive on every single one of these. Um, but for now, yeah, I'm just going to start throwing stuff on here. What's nice is um, even if it dips down into this like kind of 100 hertz, 80 hertz region here, it won't distort the low end because the low end is on its own chain. So uh, again, doing like a band splitter like this just gives you really complete control over uh, the signal. So. Cool. Um, and I'm actually going to pull this delay down so it's not. And yeah, keep it like. Sweet. Um, okay, let's see. What else do I want to do? Um, put like, uh, let's see, some chorus maybe. See what happens then. And maybe some OTT just for fun. Okay. All right, sweet. Um, so you have this little uh, bass going. Um, hopefully you saw some cool things that you can do with macros and racks. Um, I'm gonna show you another uh, Thing that can be kind of nice um, to give you some ideas of how to actually play with the macros a little bit more creatively. Let's say I have a saturator and I want to play with the amount of saturation, maybe even automate it. Ooh, but it's starting to get loud uh, real quick, so obviously I need to turn down the output too. But what if I wanted to be able to control both um, in sort of an inverse uh, relationship to each other with uh, one knob? So here's what you would do. Group the saturator, and I'm not even I'm not going to add a second chain. This is just going to be a one chain one chain uh, audio effect rack, and I'm going to uh, open up the macros. You don't really need to, but I'm going to macro this drive. Right click, map it to macro one, and I'm going to right click the output and map that to drive. Okay, so now, all right. Well, I have my drive at zero dB and my output at negative 18 because that's just where the middle is for both of them. If I put them both down here, they're at negative 36, and I put them both up here, we got 36 decibels of drive, and we're at zero decibels output, so it's actually just normal output, which would be super loud. Um, so what I want to do is click this map button right here, and let's actually take this. I, I never really want the, the drive below zero, so I'm going to just put zero there. You can see which uh, parameter it is here because they have it listed. So I'm going to put the minimum at zero and the max at 36, I guess, um, for the output. So it, let's just do this really quick to show you. If I leave it here, uh, you'll see that anywhere this is, if this is at zero, this is at negative 36 now. And if this is all the way up at 36, this is at zero. But that's not exactly what we want because this is going to be super quiet. And it's going to get a lot louder very quickly as I bring up the saturation and the output at the same time. So what we want is to make it inverse. So I'm actually going to put the minimum of the output at zero and the maximum at negative 36. So what happens now is as I pull, if this is at uh, zero, drive is at zero, output's at zero. Great. It's basically like a saturator that's not really doing much of anything. If I pull this up, now the drive goes up as the output goes down. And since the drive goes up from 0 to 36 and the output goes down from 0 to negative 36, um, anywhere it is, the numbers are going to match. So let's play this and start dragging this up. And you'll see it actually gets a little bit, it actually gets a little bit quieter up here. Because uh, I guess the input drive, since it's clipping and causing the saturation, um, the output gain has a more significant impact on the overall volume. So I'm going to click open our map again, our macro map, and put this at somewhere not so extreme. So maybe like negative 18. Um, unclick map again. All right, so now I'm just going to play my low D sharp. That's pretty, that, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, I might just make it like negative 
like 20, I guess. I think that's about uh, right. Yeah, maybe even like uh, negative 22. Okay, I think that's basically it. So now if I want to play stuff and, and twist this knob here. So now I can just twist that and I don't need to worry about constantly uh, automating the output or, um, you know, like a utility gain or something like that to match the increase in um, gain from the saturator drive. So uh, that is just an example of uh, some ways to sort of get creative with macros. I want to keep this video kind of like short, so I'm going to kind of move on from that. Let's see, we're at 30 minutes. This is good timing. Um, and yeah, let's just, uh, I have this riff here. Let's see, this is basically, it's pretty similar. Um, okay, so with this riff, I literally just put a, a kick and a snare in here just to show you the potential of having um, stuff that you can layer and control and automate with uh, macros and racks. And we got something like this. All right, great, uh, cool. Nice little bass line there. Um, <clears throat> all that we have going on here, um, I don't think, let's see, uh, I'm going to add a lane for each, by the way, if you didn't know that you could do that, you can always click, um, once, uh, automation's open. So hit a, if, if it's not, or hit this little button up here, uh, if automation's open and you click on any of these and you, uh, like if none of these are open, you can always just click in this sort of empty space right here under the automation, um, select parameter, select and click add lane for each automated envelope and it'll just pop them all open. So we only have two things being automated here. Um, the main thing is just the, uh, you know, and even if I, let's see, take that and just pull this down to the one that we just made. Um, let's see, nothing will be automated. So uh, yeah, all this is, is this reverb over here. Let's actually just we'll call it, well, whatever. We'll leave it as is. Um, this reverb automating from right there to there with like a little like shorter tail. Um, so, uh, let's see, why is that so quiet? Um, oh, because we have a three second decay time. So let's pull that back up. All right, and so next we got, let's see, uh, a little bit of reverb coming up here and a little bit of reverb doing this thing again here. Whoop. All right, pull that back down. And then all we had was um, that uh, micro shift going. So on this one, um, I won't even use the micro shift. I'll just use, let's see, oh, do I? Let's see. Yeah, we just have the regular little Haas effect delay. Um, so yeah, I'll just automate the dry wet on that. Uh, let's see, that'll be like there, pull that up to there and cool. All right. Perfect. So now we got something that sounds like should be basically the same thing. Cool. Um, hopefully that gives you some uh, some good insight onto some quick, easy ways to get a lot of like movement and uh, layers and like full sounding sounds um, and some creative control over some of your sounds just by using racks. So I really wanted the point of this video to just kind of show you the concept of racks, um, get you into the mindset that they are extremely useful um, and let you get creative with stuff in a lot of new ways. So actually the thing that I did here with this um, reverb chain you can do that with a ton of stuff. Um, like if I really wanted to, uh, I guess that wouldn't really make sense there, but let's say, you know, if I just wanted to add like a phaser into a sound, uh, let's turn this off for now and group that, put a dry chain here and this phaser, it's like kind of the same thing. So um, right click that. You can use it for some parallel processing where I always, always have the dry 
dry signal, and then I can just add in the wet signal. So um, there are some things that you know you can kind of compensate for there. Like same thing if now I'm realizing that um, it gets a lot louder when I pull that up with the reverb. That's not really a problem um, because we have it kind of just on this top chain. Um, let's uh, let's actually on this reverb thing something else that is helpful. Just while I'm thinking of it, is to put an EQ at the end um, just so that you're not you, you don't always have to use it on um, like a two band splitter and just kind of. Put that guy on there, and actually, maybe I will do this Boop. and pull this up like that. Cool. So, yep. Um, all right. So back to what I was saying about the the phaser. If we have this going, and me turning this up brings the volume up too much, like. Then you can just do the same thing we do with the saturator. Map that to the same thing. Pull open the macro mappings. And let's see. Ooh, we got to name them different things so that I actually know where I'm at. So that's dry and that's phaser. Sweet. All right. So on the dry one, um, <clears throat> let's put the minimum at zero and the maximum at like negative four maybe. Um, and this I'm just going to put, well, whatever. Yeah, we'll leave it at. We'll leave it at um, negative. Well, maybe I should just put it at four. Maybe that's how that works. <laughs> All right, cool. So now, let me actually just put this at uh, zero. Cool. And put this maybe at like negative six. Let's see. That might that might have swung too far. Nope, that's about right. Probably even go a little bit um, farther down. I think that um, the phaser you should probably you should probably also get like an EQ. So you're not. Oh, whoops. Let's do this. EQ eight, um, just so that you are not doubling up that low end, since that's really where you're gonna get. Uh... Wow, it's got com complicated fast. Throw this on the end of that guy. I mean, of course, you could also just throw this whole thing onto um, the high band there, but same kind of thing. You don't always want to. Uh, do that, so let's just kind of cut that there, and this might fix that whole problem. Let's yeah, so that'll do it actually right there. Let's just take, uh, let's actually just unmap that and put this back to zero, and let's see. Yeah, so the main issue there was just doubling up on the low end. If you double up on the top end, but the top end effect is all wet, um, then it shouldn't really be an issue with volume getting too crazy. So um, I said I was going to tease this one last thing that we will cover in the next video, but um, just to show you an example of uh, another thing that I use racks for all the time is let's take a um, sampler, just an Ableton native sampler, and throw that on a MIDI track. All right, let's group this guy up. Um, I'm just gonna leave it as the one for now. And this is something that I kind of do in some of my sound design sessions or even just while I'm working on a song. Um, and I put some of them in my sample packs occasionally. Uh, let's see, sampler material. All right, so this is... Each one of these are just single notes. Um, most of them are an E or E flat, so it's not 100% of the time, but usually the lowest key that I write in. Um, and it's a lot easier to, to, to pitch stuff up than it is down. For whatever reason, I feel like you get a little bit better fidelity uh, when you do. Then going the other way. So um, with these, let's take this uh, Mercurian bass, whatever that means, and put this in. Let's see, it was a E flat, low E flat. All right, cool. Let's uh, put this on one voice because I'm not really going to be playing chords with this. Um, yep, put this on. All right, let's. Uh, this filter, you might notice that um, it sounds uh, with the filter on, even though it looks like it's at 22 uh, kilohertz. And this is just true in general with a bunch of Ableton um, stuff. 
you have to remember to look at the key tracking. The key tracking can really uh, mess up where this filter is and make it so that what you're hearing doesn't actually reflect this. So I'm gonna turn the key tracking to zero. Oh, and pull this back down a little bit. All right, cool. Um, let's make it not such a harsh yeah, thing there. And okay, go to the sample. Let's uh, put it in this loop mode. Put a little crossfade on it. All right, so um, I used to do this um, a different way. I'll show you two ways to basically accomplish the same thing. This is how I used to do it. Um, take a velocity uh, MIDI device, throw it in the rack with this guy, um, put the out high to map macro one and the out low to um, macro one. And then you have to go in and set the minimum on both to one because if you get a zero velocity, uh, the sound just won't play. So once you have both of those set to the macros, this is controlling basically the, the out low and the out high velocity, meaning that um, whatever this is out, how, no matter how hard I hit a key, it's always going to deliver that MIDI velocity. Then we're gonna go into MIDI on the far uh, right tab of this sampler. And I'll put the range up for just posterity's sake. And we're going to take velocity and map this to sample offset. And this is important, you have to turn up the um, percentage or value, whatever, to 100. So now what we have is whenever we play a note and move this knob, it'll just play from uh, a new position. So we can do a lot of cool stuff with that. First, I'm gonna put this on glide because that's kind of bugging me. How's this sound? Cool. Um, so this is just a like a like a long E flat note that I made uh, with a bunch of processing, um, with a nice thick sub to it and some kind of little bits of movement here and there. So what's cool about this is I can just play a bunch of stuff and get a lot of variation very quickly simply by just turning this knob. Um, or you can take an LFO and throw this uh, has to be after the device and map this to um, this macro. So pull the rate down a little bit. Actually, we'll make it a little faster even. And then anytime I play, now I'm just gonna get a slightly different uh, starting position. And depending on how crazy these go, let's uh, pull up one of these other ones like. All right, so this is in a E, so let's pull this up. So anytime I play it, it's just gonna start from a new place. Um, another cool way to do this, let's get rid of this uh, velocity for a second, um, that is a lot simpler. I don't know why I showed you the more complicated one first. Um, if you just go into modulation, turn on this aux, um, and shout out Kyoto for showing me um, <laughs> the much simpler way to do this, same thing. Um, a, map A to sample offset. Turn this up all the way, and then literally just map the peak um, to macro one. And wherever this is, is gonna essentially be the same thing. Uh, let's, oh, uh, did I not do that right? Hold on here, modulation. Uh, or is it initial? Maybe we wanna put the, no, that's, that's right, let's see here. Why is that doing that? Uh, let's actually, maybe it's the initial. Let's try this guy. What is going on here? Uh, do I have, let's see. Yeah, normally it's the, the peak, so maybe that makes sense. Why? Sample offset, sample selector, it's at 100. Uh, attack, maybe it's the initial and the peak, I don't know, honestly. Just do it the, uh, let's see. <laughs> Oh, 
here we go because the velocity is still controlling this. There we go. That's dumb. Uh, all right, cool. So now that we have this, I can move this around. So it's actually not that complicated. It is way simpler. I just forgot to uh, take this effect out from the last one. So um, yeah, basically just throw the sample in there, get your loop uh, set to where you want it, go into modulation, turn on the aux, uh, map A to sample offset, pull up the value to 100 on that, and uh, then map the peak to this uh, macro. Or you can just honestly play with the peak itself, but this way you can go to other controls and still have um, other panels on here and still have control. Of it. So yeah, um, we will get into this a lot more uh, and show you some cool things that you can do with this in the next video. Like and subscribe. Um, and uh, yeah, say what's up in the comments. Let me know other videos that you want to see me do as well. Cheers.